medical student at UC Davis School of Medicine. He was actually born and raised in Sacramento, and he went and completed his undergrad at San Diego, where he studied general biology and a bachelor's in music and psychology. He was involved in leadership, uh, specifically in the student org Chicanos Latinos for Community Medicine, CCM, and providing outreach to clinic migrant workers in the San Diego area. Additionally, he also co-founded the LGBTQ plus pre-health professional students. And after graduating, he took a total of seven years before starting medical school, where he worked as a youth camp counselor, a Red Cross CPR instructor, an EMT, ER scribe, and a community health educator for Peace Corps volunteer in um, Nicaragua. And he also did some pediatric research um, in uh, in Honduras as well. He's currently the clinic co-director for a student-run uh, clinic at UC Davis called Gender Horm uh, Hormone Clinic, and he's a leader for the Gender and Sexual Diversity Student Interest Group at UC Davis as well. He wants to continue to work with underserved communities like the Latino, Chicano, and LGBTQ plus communities locally and internationally. So that is going to be our presenter, Andrew. We also have another presenter who is Manuel um, Fierro. He also is a first year medical student at UC Davis. He is from Chihuahua, Mexico. He is a first year, uh, first year, a first generation non-traditional student. After high school, he served uh, as two year representative for the Church of Jesus Christ of Later Day Saints in the Montreal, Canada, uh, Canada <laughs> area helping underserved communities in different capacities. After those two years, he earned his undergraduate degree in public health from Brigham Young University, Idaho. After graduating, he worked as a youth group leader, high school, college, slash career advisor, organic chemistry tutor, and in construction. Him and his wife are parents to a lovely one and a half year old who keeps them on their toes. He currently is a student admissions ambassador at UC Davis School of Medicine and the director of the Break the Script High School Mentorship Initiative. He enjoys spending time with his family, mentoring and helping the rising generation reach their individual goals. And lastly, I'll be today's facilitator. Like I mentioned, my name is Jenny Soniega. I actually did my undergrad at CSUN, California State University in Northridge. That's where I actually received my degrees uh, in cell and molecular biology and I did a master's in public health. Additionally, I worked in the Department of Youth and Alcohol Substance Use Prevention as a director for a nonprofit. I also was able to teach biostatistics at Cal State Northridge, along with being the academic lead for the biology department for a program called Bill Poder, uh, which actually is a program funded by the National Institutes of Health that's aiming towards diversifying the healthcare field. And currently, I'm also a first year medical student at UC Davis. Um, and I am the mentor and outreach coordinate, coordinator for the Latino Medical Student Association at UC Davis. Okay, so before we go ahead and get started with today's presentation, there's just a disclaimer to just throw out there. So we are not paid or sponsored by any of the products that are going to be mentioned today. And also the material provided is a summary of the presenter's individual experiences and should not be taken as complete. And lastly, although we represent UC Davis uh, School of Medicine, we do not speak on behalf of that institution. So we're going to go ahead and dive into today's first list of the topic, which is how do we make a list of medical schools to begin with? Specifically, we're going to be answering some of the questions that were already uh, anticipated and provided to us. But if you do have additional questions, um, go ahead and you can write that into the um, little messaging box and I can prime our presenters and get those questions answered, okay? So how much time should we put into the process of um, creating a medical school list to apply to? Uh, how does that research impact our future interviews? And how will that experience ultimately um, affect the medical school if we decide to go there? So I'm gonna go ahead and let my presenters uh, speak. Oh, sorry. Can everyone still see my screen, right? Yep. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so my name is Andrew again. It's wonderful to see everyone virtually. Uh, just as a um, just as a more background, that this webinar will be recorded. 
And a lot of the advice that Annie and I will be providing today um, will be sent out in a PDF afterwards. Um, once you get a survey um, link for your uh, for this webinar uh, seminar, you'll get a PDF of all of our advice that we'll be providing today. Um, by the way, Jenny, I think there's some background noise. Oh, um, let me see who's that might be. Christina, is it possible to go through the list and see if anyone's microphones are still on? Yeah, I don't see anybody else's microphone on, but just a quick reminder to everybody to please mute your phones if you're calling in or mute yourself on the GoToMeeting platform. Wonderful. Um, so to first off, I just want to um, first congratulate everyone for just embarking on this journey for medical school and the application process because it is a long one, but it is something that I hope is something for you can be um, a very nurturing experience in terms of understanding more of your own goals and uh, solidifying why exactly you want to pursue medicine. I think that a lot of that, the portion of the application for medical school is a way to screen out those that aren't willing to make that extra drive because there's so many hurdles to apply to medical school and to weed out those that um, may not have the correct motivations or should I say the uh, endurance to apply. Um, and so hopefully this, the information that we'll provide today will um, be helpful for a lot of individuals who uh, may be struggling to understand the full process um, or particularly have advice that may help you um, be much more successful in application. Um, so yeah, no, what I'll I, be doing, sorry, go on, Manny. Sorry, uh, sorry I was gonna add too, like, I, we hope that uh, we also make this a fun and uh, enjoyable moment because as as, Panda, as Andrew um, stated, it is a long and, and um, arduous feat to apply to medical school, but we also have to look at the, the, the Great, the, the better perspective uh, of it and enjoy the, the process uh, because if not, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be dreadful. So I, I agree with Andrew said that this is a time for you to refine if medical school is what you want to do, if you want to accomplish it. And if, you, if it is that so, then um, enjoy the process because it's one thing that will help you for the rest of your life. Thank you, Manny. And, um, I guess I should also just mention any sort of general advices um, when we're going to talk about these topics about making your list of medical schools as well as creating letters of recommendations. Um, best thing to do is um, stay organized as best you can. Um, and what I'll do is on the PDF, um, I'll, there'll also be some uh, links for certain resources that we'll be re referencing for certain blogs um, that uh, we have used. Um, I'll have also a link to the Excel sheet that I created and making my own list of medical schools and I will show everyone in just a bit uh, how that looks like. So if you want to go back and reference it, uh, these resources are available for everyone. Uh, Manny, do you have anything else to add? No, no, I think that'd be good. Okay, so Jenny, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen right now. Okay, so let me go ahead and exit out. Um, because okay. particularly in, oops, I'll shine. All right. Um, so in particular, um, and way to answer the, this main question about how do we select um, schools, uh, Manny and I both agreed upon this resource by the AAMC. If you're applying for the um, medical directing or MD programs, um, this MSAR is what is a, a shorthand for medical school admissions requirement. It's a very useful guide. Um, only costs about $16 to $25, I believe, for a year subscription. But what it has, it, it has uh, information about all the uh, MD approved uh, accredited medical schools in the US. Um, and then you are able to filter uh, based off of uh, location, based off of median MCAT GPA ranges, um, class sizes, types of schools, et cetera. Um, this resource has been invaluable and kind of narrowing down um, and gathering information from each medical school um, and then uh, it's kind of like a, a quick way to find a wiki for each of these schools without going to each of the websites individually 
So if, for example, we were to go to one of those schools, I already pulled up uh, UC Davis because we represent, we're with UC Davis Medical School. Oh, it's loading, unfortunately. So on the screen, when it loads, um, what will it list? It will list um, information about the school, the number, generally the number of students are there, um, as well as mission statements, vision statements, and I will, and once this loads, I'll go through it all. Um, it'll also actually go in some more information about program details. So if there are specialized programs that a school has like MD, PhD programs or MPH programs or JD pro combined programs, um, the MSAR will be able to list this all. Um, here we go. Um, in accessing the MS, M, MSAR, uh, this is a side note while this loads. If you qualify for the fee assistance program, um, and if you aren't familiar with it, it is, it's a, a way to, the AAMC can provide funding for you to apply to medical school. Um, they'll actually offer a free subscription to this MSAR, or the uh, this tool that I have here. Um, and so if you're applying to MD schools, there's the fee assistance program. And then if you're applying to DO schools, they also have their own uh, fee assistance program. So if you wanted to look into that, that, that way you can have access to this material for free. Um, so here has general information about uh, the schools, specialized programs, mission statements. And it's uh, usually pretty updated to what their current regular uh, statements are on the site. Um, important deadlines, um, minimal, minimal number of recommendation, letters of recommendation. So this one I found very useful uh, to see which schools required what, and also if they accepted um, whether it was committee letters or what kind of, uh, second, what, what type of letter of recommendations they required, um, it would be listed out here. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a subscription, but you, it will show information about how the interview is formatted um, for some, each of the schools, application processes. Um, and then, Andrew, can I just chime in really quick? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm actually not aware of this information. I didn't apply to any DO schools, but do you know if there is um, a site that serves like MSAR for DO school applications? Yes, so DO schools do have their own um, listing as well. Um, I did not get it though, and also the fee assistance program for that, it only pays for one school. Um, but they do have, in terms of the MSAR, there is a, um, an actual site, and I did not look that, unfortunately I should have, um, for this, but there is one that is somewhat similar, and it's more of a, I think it's a PDF rather than a website. And then I'm chiming in just to add in another question that just popped up under, and I believe this was on the MSAR, uh, but you'd have to find it in the additional like stats. Someone asked specifically, like, are you able to see the information of schools that accept out of state? I don't remember yes. where that link was, but I knew it was on there. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go, sorry, if you go all the way to the bottom, it shows it specifically how many students were accepted internationally, out of state, and in state. Um, and I think one of the questions also was if they looked at in, uh, extracurriculars, it does show what's the average amount of extracurricular hours and activities that people. Yes. Uh, right. Here. Perfect. Someone named Shy found the DO, the DO one. Okay. Yeah. So under the um, acceptance information, um, this selection factors, for example, um, as well as acceptance information, they'll list whether they accept out of state or not. And then in terms of the extracurriculars, um, it's actually listed right here under, um, let's see, disadvantage, medically underserved, oh, actually. There is a section, I don't believe it's showing right now, that shows whether they are, um, and what type of, of um, activities that previous matriculants have done. Uh, for example, did they do volunteering? Did they do research? 
Um, did they do military? And that should be listed under one of these. Unfortunately, I cannot find it now. Um, so this is a great resource to check out. Uh, Manny, do you have any other? Um, for the for the the MSR, I, I would highly recommend it just because um, there will be so much so much information out there in the web that you can look up for schools, and sometimes you'll get bogged down on the little details of everything. Uh, but the MSR is a really good investment um, that summarizes every school, so that you're able to compare it, and also with it, you're able to see what schools are in your reach and um, depending on what type of applicant you are. Um, that way it avoids you um, having to use an unnecessary amount of money and put more debt in your pocket. And so I highly recommend this MSR application to really compare. And there's another feature uh, that's not shown, it's only shown when you are, uh, when you buy the, the subscription, you're able to compare school to school and it comes out of a, a chart and it shows basically the differences of an acceptance, how many hours they need so and et cetera. So that's another thing that comes with that program um, once you purchase it. Excellent. Okay. Are you ready to share back? Yeah, I'll share back. All right. So we pretty much touched in regard to using um, MSAR. I think in regards to how much time we put into the process is really specific. Um, I think Andrew talked on it in terms of like your own personal goals that you set up. I don't know if uh, either Andrew or Manny would like to share their own personal timeline that they have created in terms of uh, doing this. Yeah, I can I can go first. Um, I think I I started my research about six months before the application uh, opened up, and I did so um, kind of in a, a, a little bit with more time, I would say, just because I wanted to really understand. I really want to know where we would end. Uh, my family and I would end up. Uh, See, so I'm married and we're gonna have a child. Uh, I really wanted to get the most information I could, but in doing so. I was um, bogged down by the small details of everything that I lost myself in trying to learn everything about the school. And so I would have given myself less time to be searched and just focus on the small things, on, on, on the important things, such as like those found in the MSAR, and really just based on those stat statistics and knowing what schools are, are good for, for me and they are fit for, um, I would have saved myself more time. Um, doing those things instead of having to go six months before and looking at everything down. So that's one of the things. So I would I would say a good less than six months would be good. Okay. Um, I have to agree, Manny. I probably started about six months ahead of time as well. So about January time of my application cycle. Um, and I intentionally tried not to look too deeply into all the programs because I knew that there was going to be informational flooding. What I did focus on was mainly location. Um, and actually, we'll go I'll touch upon these factors. But I would say I only spent about a week's worth of time, but split over a couple of months. Um, because a lot of information that you research initially, you, you may forget. So you have to go back again and then kind of dive into it. And that kind of information that you dive in will one will depend if you get a secondary, which depending, most likely you may get a secondary, but mainly it will be for the interview cycle. So that's when you'll probably do a lot more of the research than um, and right before your interview, research heavily at that point. I think actually answer the next question. Thank you. So for those of us who have just joined, um, don't feel the need to have to like write or note anything if you just want to like listen to um, the presenter's you know personal experience in regards to the application process um, specifically like making a list of schools and getting their letters because at the end of this you will be taking a survey and there will be given like a PDF where each of the presenters has written down their own specific like highlights and points to answer each of these bullet points okay all right so we're gonna move on to the next question so what questions did you ask when considering a school to apply to? What resources did you use to determine if a school is a good fit? And what factors did you consider the most? 
whoever would like to start first. You can go ahead, Andrew, if you want. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like a pop up. Um, so first thing off is definitely, and I think this whole process is going to require a lot of deep reflection, um, particularly on who you are, what your ultimate goals are as a physician, and you'll be answering this over and over again. Um, but this is, these are the kind of questions that you'll need to be asking yourself because it'll help guide you into the correct amount of uh, the correct program that's best fit for you. Um, a lot of the pressures out there are by the big names or et cetera. You want to go into the top whatever for whatever type of category. But I think what's most important for you as a future physician is to find a place that makes you the best physician. And so that is going to first require a lot of internal uh, introspection understanding where your goals, strengths, and weaknesses lie, and then being able to find a medical school program that kind of reflects those kind of values that you have. Um, so yes. other things, oh, sorry. Oh, uh, other things that you can think okay. about are certain populations or communities that you want to work with or certain research field that you are interested in or specialty um, to find these kind of programs. If these are um, if these are things that are of high value to you, find programs that kind of that align and and uh, really emphasize these kinds of activities. Oh, man, and I was gonna ch I, yeah, I was gonna chime in there. Yeah, and this is the time to really to reflect on, on who you are and what your goals are for the future. Um, one, one thing that I tell a lot of the interviewees that come to the school is no matter what school you go to, um, you will get the MD, you'll become a doctor, you have the, the two letters behind your name. And so I think that really knowing how, what things you want out of the school and what things you wanna to give to the school is really important in this process because um, being able to go to a school where you feel happy, where you feel the best you, uh, I think speaks uh, greatly because that will impact the type of doctor that you will be in the future and the type of care that you will provide to the people that you will be uh, being the physician for. And based, if, you, if you can focus that on that, on where you honestly think will be, be the best fit for you, maybe the Ivy Leagues, the big names that we may say, uh, might be the best fit for you, maybe they may not. And so this is the time for you to really see, okay, what do I want? What do I want to accomplish? Will this, per, will this institution help me get to the next step? Because becoming a physician isn't just getting to medical school. It's, it takes millions and millions of steps. Uh, it's a whole journey. And so making sure that you really understand who you are, what you want in your life, and what your goals are um, will really make a difference in knowing what school to apply to. And also, it saves you money because, as we all know, these applications aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... You don't want to add debt on the top of the debt that you're going to get from medical school because that's a lot. Yeah, I do. I do want to add a plug in terms of again the fee assistance program. Um, if you do qualify for that, you get up to uh, 16 uh, primary. I think actually up to up to 19 or 20 this year. Um, free primary applications, and then a lot of schools will waive your secondary application <coughs> prices as well. So. I really want to push out for those that think may qualify. If you don't, if you're not 100% sure you may not qualify, apply anyway. And the thing they'll say is just no, but if you do get it, then you'll get a lot, you'll save a lot in the process. It never hurts to, never hurts to, to apply. And going on to the next, like the next question of what resources uh, that I use to determine the school is a good fit. Uh, I use the MSAR uh, personally. I, I looked at the school, the, the mission statement, how they apply the mission statement. Um, and additionally, I talked to the school, the students that were already there at the institution, uh, seeing how they felt um, um, about the school, and it was a really good fit for me. Uh, additionally, I think that looking at the surrounding area uh, of the school uh, was also a good way to me to determine if that school was a good for me, seeing what the location, the city, um, what was it around, was it safe, um and yeah awesome great thank you guys um i do i do want to add on a little bit quickly um and using the mstar tool 
And I think just in terms of applying for medical schools, definitely, definitely, definitely consider applying to in-state schools because well, you'll have that preference um, versus just apply to, I think that's a, a great idea is just apply to all the in-state schools that you'd be willing to go to and then um, branch out to private schools and then out-of-state schools from there out um, because you do have the most benefit from there. And then as Manny did say, and I, I would like to emphasize, is again, thinking about the support systems and the financial aid packages uh, or what would be most financially um, intelligent and or for your decisions and making sure you're most successful uh, in medical school. Okay. Um, sorry, Jenny, yeah? No worries. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next question. So how did you make sure that you knew why you were applying to a particular school and how did you determine the school would help you achieve your goals as a physician or mold you into the position you aspired to be as you, you know, go through the journey? Um, I think you guys kind of touched on this, but if anyone would like to just a quick summary to that, because I feel like that was kind of answered in this previous question. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I do want to. Sorry, Manny, do you want to go? No, 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 go for it. I was just saying, yeah, that we can kind of answer it. <laughs> um, one thing I do want to, I do want to, I think, in um, this early process as you're making this list um, of which schools to apply to, keep that, make sure that you're able to justify that because one, it'll come up again in your secondary, two, it'll come back again in your interviews. And then three, they'll be able to see it in all that if you were telling something that was a truth or a lie and if it was something that is um, reasonable. For example, if you're applying to a school in the West Coast or sorry, East Coast, um, they may ask, which I was asked, like, why would someone from California want to come out to the East Coast? And so you got to make sure you have a well solid answer. Um, so the sooner you think about that now and be able to justify it to yourself or maybe others around you, and then you'll be able to justify into your secondary interviews, the better. Where are we going to oh. this one? Oh. And then um, I think um, a little bit about what Manny was saying earlier. Um, actually, I, I would turn, deter a little bit away that rather the school may get you, may help you to become a good physician, but also it's whatever, as with anything in life, whatever you put into it, you'll get out of it. So let's say, for example, you don't go into a school that's not necessarily the best fit for you, um, but you can still become a really great physician out of it. And so it's gonna take a lot of this um, vision of what we think was would be an ideal school may change as we're going through our medical education. So I think in, the process as long as you're staying true to your core values and then you see the institution have those very similar core, core values, that will be fine. There's gonna be a lot of um, issues in terms of curriculum or administration and across any other, any kind of medical school, especially as there's always changes every year. Um, but what's most important is maintaining to those core values of uh, institutional values, of communities, research, et cetera, that are important to you. Yeah, yeah, and I, I will I will thank you, Andrew, for, for clarifying that because, yeah, no matter what school you go to, uh, you make the best out of it. Uh, it's up to you to decide uh, what what things to do, what things to improve. And one of the things that I learned um, through the application process not being in medical school is that I always thought people that applied and were in medical school knew what they wanted out of life and knew exactly what they wanted to do. And I'm going to tell you out straight up front, there's a lot of people that don't know um, what things they want to accomplish. They're still learning about themselves. And so when we, t when we say about learning about you, you don't have to perfect your knowledge about you because you're going to keep learning and learning and learning more and learning more and understanding that you, um, growing your mindset and growing a different perspective. Um, so as you go through this application process, realize that it's actually a journey. You're never going to get to the perfect state of, okay, I'm the perfect applicant and I'm going to be great for this school. That's not going to happen because life always throws us different curve, different curveballs, and uh, baseball. So you might strike out. So um, just keep in mind that as you go through all this, um, 
it, it's what you put in and what you um, reflect on yourself that will make the biggest difference uh, through this application process and once you start school. And then just two, two questions that came up through the group chat. Um, Manny, I remember you had mentioned this as in connecting with students at the schools that you anticipated would be a good fit. How did you actually go yeah. about connecting with those students? And then I guess the second question to from a separate student was in regards to feeling like you're a good applicant or a good fit for a school's program, but not feeling maybe too confident about the MCAT score. Any uh, advice? So I mean, I could definitely share advice too on the MCAT score um, as well at the end of it. Yeah, uh, I can share. I can share about the contacting the students. So uh, when you contact, so what, one thing I did is I contacted the admissions uh, uh, department of the school and asked if I could be connected with some students uh, to talk to, ask about the school I was interested. They'll have student ambassadors, just as uh, UC Davis. I'm one of them, and there's other three of us that they can get in contact with. And once I get in, got in contact with them, because I knew that they were ambassadors, so they were always going to try to sell the school, right? I would ask if I can get connected with other students uh, to, ask their, to ask for their opinions. Uh, and so I kind of diverted in that networking aspect of reaching out to different types of students, because I really wanted to get a different perspective uh, from everyone, um, not just base it off on one student who, who loved their school immensely, but uh, to make sure that I got a, a, a well-based information base of that school. So that's one of the ways I reached out to students. Um, from the individual schools I was applying to. And then did you contact them before or after secondary or uh, interview date? So I contacted I contacted some, I wouldn't say I contacted everybody, I contacted some before the application. Uh, I submitted my application just to know if that was that school was worth my time to apply to uh, and my money. Because I mentioned this a lot, of, like I unfortunately didn't qualify for the finance, the, the the fee assistance, um, and so I, I contacted some before, and then while during secondaries, I contacted them as well, uh, other students, to see what type of secondaries they like, their schools like to hear, uh, just because they already got accepted, and then after interviews, uh, I really honed down on more questions of like, all right, why do you really love this school? Why do you want? Why would I want to come here? And so on and so forth. So I think it's based off of your needs as you go through the application process of what questions come up. Then you start reaching out to more. I started reaching out to more and more students uh, for their input. And then, did anyone want to elaborate on being a good fit, possibly, but this like the confidence of the score of the MCAT component? I mean, if not, I guess. I could tackle it. Yeah, you said, yeah. I, I have no shame. I took the MCAT twice, and it's it's a it's a it's an exam. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I know that there's plenty of people who have taken the MCAT more than once. Um, and I think, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of like all medical schools, but I I know for a fact, like after speaking to like admissions individuals, they're always looking for that upward trend at the end of the day. Um, so I think, you know, in being honest with yourself and, and noting, you know, have you seen that if you've taken it more than once? Um, and then really taking the time and the effort of your application because like your score is just a component of your application, right? You still have your personal statement, you still have the overall things that you've been in. Um, who knows, maybe you did really great research and you've done publications. You have other elements to your application you are not just a score and I know that sounds like a lot of people don't want to believe that I mean when I was in your shoes I didn't want to believe that I was like yeah I don't believe <laughs> in that and Manny's laughing because it's the truth like it's it's how you feel um but I honestly can't stress enough the fact that you know it's it's more of like that mental uh stamina that you have to be able to be comfortable with and believing in yourself and you know, putting in the work and effort to your application. You know, um, as Andrew had mentioned, being true to yourself, that is going to all emanate out from your application. Um, so, you know, if you feel like it's just gonna all boil down to the score, I can't speak on behalf of every institution, obviously, like I said, but I, I think 
that there are a good amount of institutions that look holistically at individual applications and you can actually see that isn't that on the msar right like it notes like it does like a holistic interview um interview holistic application review so you can see right. those things um based off the school i don't know if that can possibly bring comfort to that question um but yeah, I, I, that's my experience something i think i would add is um maybe seek out a um pre-med advisor who be able to look at through your application. Um, I think that's one out, one thing to think about is what does it look like your application by itself, but also what kind of programs that you're looking into um, and what kind of goals that you're kind of setting. I think all these factors will kind of play in together in which whether you decide to apply with what you have right now or do you think it's necessary to retake the NCAT to work on improving your score? So that way um, it may delay your application either this year or to next year, but then it may open up other programs that you may want to consider. So I think that's something that we can't necessarily answer specifically, but these are um, think factors to consider. Yeah, and what I, if I can chime in as well, um, I completely agree with both uh, both uh, Jenny, uh, Jenny and um, Andrew, um, that, you know, it's really important to see, first of all, the MCAT is just a test. It is not everything. Uh, how, uh, how she mentioned that, you know, your application is, is you have an overall application. Uh, I can tell you right now um, from, like, as well, I can't speak for other schools, but from our, our perspective, we, we look at the holistic view. We look at everything that the person, that individual has done, because when you're when you're when you're a physician, when you're a doctor in the future, it's not a patient's not going to come up to you and be like, "All right, I have these symptoms," and they're not going to be like, "Okay, the answer could be A, B, C, or D," and you have to pick one. No, you have to critically think and critically uh, decipher what is going on. So showing that you have those those capabilities and those uh, um, I forget, I lost the train of thought. But if you have those, if you show those uh, attributes, I go then the schools will look at you and see like, you know, this applicant, no matter, maybe, maybe the MCAT, maybe that day that you took the MCAT was not your day. Maybe something happened that like completely threw it off and, and, and maybe didn't score the way that you wanted to score. And maybe you, you know that your, your application is strong and it will stand out from the rest, even though the score is different. And so looking at yourself, but also like Andrew said, being honest with yourself, what type of application you have, uh, if it's a strong one overall, then, go for it. But also there's always, you always, like we mentioned, is a lot of reflection to really understand, do, do I have what, what is, do I have what is needed for this application to stand out uh, from, from, to these schools? So that's one of the things to also keep, keep, in, keep in pondering uh, through that process. But one thing, and one thing only, is stay away from student doctor network when they talk about all the MCAT scores, because you will see millions of MCAT scores and you will get really sad really quickly just because you see one or two that got in 100 percentile and you're like oh my gosh everybody's getting 100 percentile and i'm not there um that is that's just one out of thousands of applicants out there and so i know it's hard not to stay to not to stay away from that but please keep trying to wait as much you can <laughs> definitely all right so to bring us back <laughs> Uh, towards the um, question. So how did you determine whether the campus setting would be right for you? And do you narrow down your school selection based on that factor? And then additionally, um, if you are an individual underrepresented in medicine, how do you, uh, how did you determine that you would feel welcome and safe at that school? First one, <laughs> campus setting. Um, how did you determine if that would be right for all of us and was that a factor in selecting the school yeah absolutely the factors i considered would be uh amenities communities i wanted to work with um and then um the if the the more that they align to uh these factors the more i i rank highly so um not only location but i think geographically how close i was to family um or my support networks i think that's what's most important to me um, I'm sorry, and I do want to mention to everyone that our contact information will be on that PDF, so our phone numbers and emails will be there. So if, if you have to leave right now, 
and want to contact us out later, um, please feel free to message us in any way that you like. Text me. Uh, you can email me, and then we'll be able to respond to you. Um, Same here. In uh, Manny, do you have any other factors for those? No, I could. No, I, I completely agree with you. I think looking at what uh, ask what communities you want to serve, um, what practice, what type of practice you want to have in the future, um, really goes into determining what school um, uh, setting you want. So, is it urban, suburban, or rural? Uh, and also, how uh, Andrew said, just keep in mind geographically how distant you are from your family support because those are going to be really important. Uh, do your transition into medical school. Uh, but yeah, I completely agree with everything that that, that Andrew said. And then the next uh, question is, how did you determine you would feel welcome, comfortable, and safe at the school if you're underrepresented in medicine? Um, say particularly if you're underrepresented, try to find individuals who are of that community that are, that are there. So um, let's say, for example, this is pre-interview. Um, as Manny said, try to get connected with ambassadors of that community member, of that uh, community you identify with. But if you're on there for an interview, try to meet them in person. Um, and then you kind of got to get a feel of asking personal questions, how, how comfortable they feel, um, how supported they feel in that, um, in that environment, um, is there a good representation, et cetera. And, and, that was yep, 100%. How was it? Definite. So seeking out um, the communities in which you identify as. And then what types of curriculum did you come across during the application process? And how did you determine which one would be best uh, set up for your success? So I, I can start off with that one. Yeah, yeah, I'll go with that one. Um, I think what I can, I basically it comes down to once I encounter with two, two types of curriculum, so it's just organ based system where they go based on uh, the organ system and talk about everything that the organ system has, like the pathology, pathophysiology, the, the pharmacology, uh, the physiology, and all that stuff. And other ones is just block space, just by sciences. So, we, so um, they have the basic science, they, they have biochemistry, physiology, anatomy all together, and then they build up continually afterwards as you move on to medical school. Um, me personally, I didn't really care about the curriculum because no matter what, there's not like a, one thing I realized is there's no perfect curriculum. Um, everyone's gonna have their picks, and you have to really consider what, what, how you like learning. But me personally, I, I, I had the mindset that I determine what education I get and what I get out of it. How am I gonna study and how am I gonna adapt? One of the, the biggest attributes that you should uh, go into medical school with is being flexible because there's always gonna be different things coming in and out of your life. And so, and there's gonna be different things thrown at you in base of curriculum or knowledge or, or information. And so being able to, and so I realized when I, when I realized that, I, really, I came to the, the, the realization that, you know, I myself am the one that determines how my schooling goes. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna wait for a school to teach me everything that I need to learn. I'm gonna, Take it upon myself because I'm already paying a lot of money to go through this. I'm, I'm sacrificing a lot of time. My friends are out there enjoying their lives, putting pictures on Instagram that they're traveling and, and doing all those fast, uh, amazing things. But I realized that I, it, it's up to me to determine what type of education I will get out of the institution that I, I will attend. Um, so it's always up to you from my perspective. Things I would like to add. Thank you, Manny. Um, other Kind of styles of educating would be team team based learning, reverse classroom, flip classroom, for example. And I have to agree with Manny that all these different ways that curriculums are being taught sound fantastic on paper. And in terms of practice, what medical school, all medical schools across the nation are going to give you the same sort of information because it's all going to prepare you to take your board exams. Now, the way that you learn is going to be up to you and in certain independence that you have. Uh, will be dependent on schools. Will they require attendance? Will they not? Or is it going to be online based? Is this going to be self paced? Um, and understanding your own learning style, if you need to be, see things in person versus you can you do it all at home and do it at your own pace, uh, these are things to factor in. Um, most schools typically do have 
traditional lectures in some way or form, but then they become optional. At least that's how it is at UC Davis. Uh, but what I found for me personally, um, in terms of the curriculum is that sure, we're paying a lot of money to get this information and we're gonna get some, the updates of what the medical information is. But in terms of the actual basic sciences, what I need to do, uh, I actually uh, resort to a lot of out secondary outside resources. So uh, sources like Anki, Sketchy, Pathoma, um, you know, uh, Google will be eventually in the future. But these are information, Boards and Beyond, for example, uh, these information, these are from secondary privatized uh, resources that are massively used and they're streamlined to give the information that is most high yield, but also that's in the most clear way as well. Whereas certain, and as you go through medical school, sometimes as we've all experienced in undergraduate, that some lectures are hit or miss. Sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not. And you know, because we have such limited time in medical school, we can't really take that chance so often. So for me, I've chosen to resort to the secondary outside resources as my main source of learning, and I supplement with the, the school's curriculum. And again, it will depend on your learning style and as well as um, whatever resources you work best with. Um, but that is something to consider that not the, the curriculum, school's curriculum won't necessarily be, at least it wasn't for me, a high uh, factor or ranking a factor as I rank the schools. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So we're going to go on to the next one. Um, how do you critically analyze the school's mission statement? How did you determine that the school's action aligns with its mission? I can take that one um, first. Um, I think just looking at key words in the mission statement that stand out to you, uh, really knowing. Um, so what I did personally is I was based on that. I really wanted to go to school that uh, focus on diversity and community service and so uh, I really looked at those how those things were applied in their mission statement so I really looked into it I I read some articles about how the, how the schools were involved in their community if they're really involved or not um, so I would really look at what things you want to do um, look at what what your goal is if you want to do research and you might want to focus on a school that focuses on research or if you want to um, focus on a school that does global health and you can do certain things. So you just look at what things you want to do and focus on those keywords. Um, afterwards, I looked like by reading those articles about how the schools were involved in the community, and how diverse they were, looking at the statistics, I was able to see how they were implementing the mission statement. Uh, if they were implemented fully, uh, partially, they just put it on paper. Um, that's one of the ways that, that I went about it. And also, how I mentioned before, reaching out to the students and in my questions to them, ask them. Um, about those the diversity and community service at the schools for me personally were um, how they were implementing that in their education if they felt that it was being applied as a student uh, or what things they can improve from that mission statement so that's how i went about it um, through that process 100 percent agree everything that manny said nothing to add um <laughs> jenny since this is the last point last question for this section i'm going to share my screen okay. um just to show everyone that list of how I stay organized. Okay. Um, of medical schools. So I created an Excel sheet and this is kind of like a general advice for everyone else, um, just to stay organized in which schools you're applying to. Um, Excel sheet may work for you if writing it out, maybe work for you, whatever works, whatever floats your boat. Uh, what I did is I would rank them on the left-hand side, uh, the kind of schools I, I was looking into and then the kind of information I gathered, I got I got a lot of it from the MSR. So location, um, GPA, MCAT, what kind of special programs. I copied and pasted the mission statements so I can always look back to them quicker. Uh, the letter recommendation requirements. Um, and they'll also, MSR will say whether they screen for secondaries or not. So when you're thinking ahead in this application, you also need to think about timing for your secondary applications and when um, how soon you'll need to pre-write them or not. So I also gathered that information here. Teaching methods, curriculum, is it traditional or is it systems-based? Um, is there any certain uh, requirements for research or do you have to do a special year to do um, research, et cetera? Um, also was a pass-fail gra grading, that's also all on MSAR. Uh, how soon do you see the patients, costing, um, and then any other special things. 
Um, so main thing that really helped me stay organized was actually writing out the dates in which um, I submitted my primary application. And then when my application got forwarded to their, their schools, and then when I got their secondary uh, invite. So as many, hopefully everyone knows about secondary applications is that um, after your primary, you'll have to resubmit a, a second set of essays. And the general recommendation from my heard is to respond back within one to two weeks. Um, so this was a way for me to keep track of when I got those secondaries and then how soon I needed to submit them. So I also created a target submission dates and the actual date I submitted them. Um, and then I looked at if I got interviews, yes or no, and then the kind of statuses. And I just color coded it, color coordinated it um, just so it's easier for my eyes. Um, so again, this list is on the PDF that we send out. Um, but so if you want to look at some sort of format and how you can uh, arrange it, but this is how I organized it um, and made and stayed in con and kind of stayed on top of any sort of deadlines that I had because um, sometimes schools uh, sent out secondaries right away, sometimes they didn't, and you didn't want to get lost on which schools you need to apply to or not. Um, so that was it. All right, Jenny. Sorry, I was just responding to um, one of the the messages really quick. Sure. I'll finish that in a second. Okay. Okay. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and move on to the awesome letters of recommendation. So how early did you reach out to letter writers? And for professors that you feel you didn't know very well, what did you do to build a relationship with them? Do you want me to, you want me to go first? I'm <laughs> like Manny or Andrew. Or uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go first. I'll go first. So uh, one of the things that I did was um, how early did I reach out to uh, letter, write, uh, letter writers? I was basically after I kind of ended my, if I ended a, a certain event with them, like research or community service or my class, I, I asked them if it would be possible for them to write me a letter of recommendation in the future for medical school. Um, and so I kind of did it that way so that they knew that it was in their minds. and. I, as I went throughout, I would just keep reaching out to them and telling them new things that were going on. And for the professors that I didn't know very well and what did I do to build a relationship with them that I knew that would be a standout letter recommendation for them, I would just um, input uh, when you're writing, a, you're writing an email or you're going to talk to them, probably t input information about the stuff that you've accomplished. Uh, the things that you have done that you uh, are proud to uh, share with others and so that way they get to know you and also uh, they get to ask more questions they get more intrigued about yourself I also um, um, set up meetings where you can talk with those professors one-on-one -on -one and get to know them better as well so that they get comfortable with you and you get comfortable with them if need be that you need to ask uh, additional things on top of letter recommendations um, so that's kind of my the answer I have. Yeah, um, I also agree with all that. Um, in terms of how early um, you would ask, I think it's exactly so as soon as you finish your experience with them, whether it's with a class, whether it's with work, research project, community project, etc. Um, as soon as you're nearing it, ask them in person um, is best. I know that currently now with the pandemic it may be a bit difficult, but ask them in person if possible. And you want to be sure to emphasize if they are comfortable writing a strong letter of recommendation. Anyone can write a letter of recommendation, but what's most importantly is if they stay strong. And you can really see from them their expressions if they are really confident saying yes or no. And a lot of letter writers, from what I've heard, are confident to say no if they don't feel like they can make a strong letter of recommendation. Um, so emphasizing those terminologies um, when you're asking is important. In terms of uh, when you get your letters, I reached out as soon as um, probably years, because uh, I took seven years off. I knew I was going to apply eventually in the future. Um, so I had saved it um, into Interfolio. If you're not familiar with what Interfolio is, it's a, a database that you can save uh, letter recommendations for. And then how you can uh, resend it to them later in the future to have them updated. Um, 
So then when I did reach out to them and ask for a letter of recommendation, um, something that I think general concept about letter of recommendations, it may feel as though we don't have as much control in seeing what other what people are, are going to write about you. Um, but there's actually a lot of things that we can do to make sure we do have some control in the things that we can say. Um, and as also how soon um, they can send them. So things that I would do is create uh, a kind of a fake deadline for them because they don't, letter writers don't necessarily know the exact deadlines you need. It's dependent on what you tell them. So I would tell them that they have about four weeks to eight weeks um, and I would make it up like by May 5th, um, please submit your letters by this time. It was actually like a month or two before those actually do for your primary applications. And that way, in case that they need extra time or they're they're lagging a little bit, at least you have that buffer time. And it's always it's always good to have it early. Um, when I things that I would submit, um, well, actually I'll say that later. Um, and then as you ask them for their recommendation, and they agreed, and after you submit all these supporting documents, um, you want to also remind them very kindly every one two weeks. Um, just to make sure that they're on it and um, and then just kind of follow up and see any ways that you can support them um, to writing uh, your letter recommendation. Um, and I'll talk about that later, so factors and how you can kind of guide them um, in your letter writing. Um, in terms yeah. of, sorry? No, sorry, I was in, uh, keep going, I'll answer, I'll, I'll input after you're done with the answering the question. Okay. Um, the next one was about uh, how do I get well to get to know uh, professors who I didn't feel knew me very well. Um, a lot of letter writing is pers it's relationship building. And, you know, just think of this as like you're dating someone. You know, you want to get to know them for them to get to know you. Um, if you don't know how to break that ice, especially in this, because we're in this hierarchy of power, you know, professors and we're students, um, one really great way to kind of break that ice is to seek advice. Um, because to seek advice from someone is a, a form of flattery because it, it shows that you trust what they're saying, uh, but it also allows, them, it gives them the power to kind of invest their energy into you. And so if you, what I would do is I would ask advice on careers. I would even get personal like life advice or, um, you know, what should I do in the situations or these are the, the things that I'm very passionate about. Um, and, you know, what do you think about that? I think um, creating these conversations over time can um, allow them to give a good perspective of who you are as a character and um, they'll be much more willing to write about that. In cases in which time is very limited. Um, for example, let's say you have um, a letter writer in mind, but you wanna do something quick. Um, you know, try to do as much of what we're saying right now, like get to know them as best you can, um, but also just keep it very focused on um, if you have certain supporting materials that shows that they can write you a good letter or recommendation. Um, so, for example, if you've done projects with them, if you've um, helped them in certain ways, et cetera, X, Y, and Z, these are factors that are uh, tangible and things that they'll be able to write about very easily. Um, even if they may not necessarily know you very, very well, at least this is something that they can have substance to write upon. Um, so that that is one um, aspect. And then also, constantly maintaining contact with them with update emails of what you're up to, um, like say certain work, project, et cetera, um, certain plans. This is a way to, kind of, again, kind of build that relationship in, in this mentorship. Thank you, Andrew. And one, of the, one of the things I wanted to add is um, it's, really, it's really important that the professors uh, get to know you the most that is possible just because letters of recommendation is basically vouching for you the application you're turning in, submitting, is who you really are. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, uh, taking that time to get to know them, uh, just like building a relationship, uh, it takes time and, and effort from your part. Um, letter of recommendation, uh, the, the, if you need it from a professor, a community service director, where it may be, it's determined each by each school. 
um, what letters of recommendation they need. And the MSAR is a, a good application that you can look up and see what type of letter of recommendations they, uh, they require, or you can just email the admissions uh, department of that school and ask them. But yeah, just keeping that constant communication and, and being open. Uh, if a professor comes up to you and tells you that they can only, they don't want you to write, a, they don't want to write a letter of recommendation for you uh, just because they don't know you, uh, then I, that's probably a sign to, you know, be, be more involved with that professor or that individual, whether it be uh, going to office hours, if you're still in, in school, um, uh, how Andrew mentioned, going to, uh, uh, working with them research at uh, community service. Um, that way it's uh, because that way you get to know them and get to know you because it's really crucial uh, aspect of that letter recommendation is how I mentioned vouching for you to the admissions committee because they won't they won't get to meet you in person until you're invited to an interview. So all the all the thing that they're basing themselves on on is your word, and then they have to have I would say witnesses that your word is true. Uh, so that's one of the one one of the important things about the recommendations that that um, are given by people that will, how Andrew said will write a strong letter of recommendation and that know who you are and that can vouch for you um, in that application process. Perfect. I think you guys did a really great job in terms of like giving like helpful advice. Um, I'm thinking back to my undergrad days too, like I pretty much, you know, did live in a lot of my professor's office hours. So, and it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's possible if you have the time ability to do so. And for some of us, like, you know, during graduate for me, I didn't have that much time anymore because I was working like three jobs. So figuring out what it is, if it's, I started doing like um, three month check-in emails with those professors that were gonna write letters for me, uh, just to give them like updates, like Andrew had mentioned. So all these were really great advice. Okay, so next one is what did you include guidelines, tips, or personal statements, et cetera, when reaching out and asking for letters. All right, so. Um, this, is Andrew, this, this, is Andrew, this is Andrew's specialty. This, yes, this is my cup of tea. So, <laughs> after I, I've, already mentioned, <laughs> so I've already mentioned before about adding, um, asking in person. So in the action, when they said yes, I would, have a follow-up email that would have all these information um, a lot of the resources um, as well as deadlines and how to submit so i would say first thing off i would say thank you you know thank you for, for them to uh, volunteer the time to write this i would provide a brief summary of the kind of work that i had done with them or that they had physically been able to see or for example if it's not work certain conversations i had between us so certain memory triggers for them to kind of spark the memory about who you are, um, and then as well as things that they can write about in your um, essay, in your letter. Um, and then I also gave them specific examples that correlated to the double AMC core competency um, guidelines from a letter writer. So this is a link I posted in the PDF, but it's also something you can Google, it's just double AMC guidelines for letter writers. And this list, um, actually it's instructions that you can forward to your letter writers. Um, and then a list or or um, should, you should, should be able to support you as an applicant overall that uh, says that you're ready for medical school. So for example, um, do you have critical reasoning competencies, so, uh, science competencies, uh, pre-professional competencies like social skills, et cetera. Um, so, for example, I, let's say I, I was working with this uh, professor who did, I did research with, and the letter, I would kind of give that brief summary of like, this is the timeline I worked with you. Um, would you be able to work on, um, as an example, would you be able to write a little bit about my critical thinking? Um, for example, there was this project that I had worked with you. Um, can you talk a little bit about my written communication? You can talk about this article I worked work with you. Let's say it's um, let's say it's someone actually uh, just a mentor in general. Um, I asked them, can you focus on my um, social skills like oral communication and like for example, we had a conversation about X, Y, and Z. Can you talk a little bit about ethical responsibilities? Can you, can you mention a little bit about my work or the conversations we had about X, Y, and Z? Um, so this is the way 
that we are able to, as the recipients, to kind of control what exactly they are going to write in their letter. Um, for them as letter writers, this is going to be, it makes it much easier for them to write for you a good letter because one, it's, you're providing the examples, you're also providing example um, details that maybe they don't remember. So if you're able to elaborate as much as possible, it just makes it easier for them. Um, also, you can split up. Um, the way I did is I had I think Andrew's internet just cut. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, I think it really did. Uh oh. Hold on, let me stop sharing for a second. Sharing. Well, I mean, if when he comes back, he can finish off. Because yeah. um, that's, that's his cup of tea. Yeah, there was one question on here that I noted someone asked. Um, about community college versus like a four-year university and getting a letter of rec between the two. There really mm -hmm. is no difference. Um, I mean, I actually got letters of recs that weren't from college at all, um, but from things that I was involved in in the community. So I mean, I, I don't think it matters. What do you think, Manny? Yeah, I, I agree. I think what matters is if the person really knew who you knows who you are and can vouch for the, the the attributes that you're you're putting on on your application i think if they can vouch for you and they uh, it, it can't be like your best friend or or um your family member but someone else in the community that really knows you so it might be your community college professor it might be someone that you served in in whatever extracurricular you were in it might be your coach um if you were in athletics uh, it just has to be someone that can really, I mentioned, really vouch for you and say, you know, this student, I strongly recommend this student because X, Y, and Z, which correlate to X, Y, and Z that was put on the application. Um, and one of the things that will happen is a lot of the times, uh, well, not a lot of times, all the time, you can't really see what the professors or the people that you will write, uh, the letters will say in those letters because it's supposed to be confidential. Um, that's why how Andrew, hopefully Andrew comes back and he keeps talking about what to input into uh, when asking them what to write. Uh, because that, that way you can mold the letter vicariously uh, as a proxy to make it sure that it represents what you're putting in the application. Perfect. And then since we're waiting for Andrew to come back, I'm just going to answer note some of these questions in here. Um, did you have a situation in, oh wait, perfect, Andrew's back. Yeah, um, Andrew's back, yeah. Did you have experience in this? Um, can you, can you hear us? Andrew? Okay, um, oh, there you are. Can you hear me? Oh. I can answer oh. the, oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. okay. Sorry. Can I ask you a question really quick? Yeah, oh, that? sorry. What was the last part that what was heard? <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought it was to me. <laughs> Your train of thought in regards to um hold up. I already flipped to the next one. Yeah, that was yeah, that was it. Do you want to just pick back the sentence before that? Oh. There we go. I'll just switch the uh, audio as they send. Okay. Do you want to just um, get back to that, the one sentence prior? What was the last thing that you all heard? You kind of so just you, went, that you were divided into sections. There you go. Oh, wait, did I also meant, did y'all hear about like what, uh, to attach like the documents I attached next, et cetera. So you were mentioning where they could find like the tips for their letter writers. Oh my gosh, was that way back? <laughs> um, <laughs> I just went on this technology. Okay. Apologies. Um, so <laughs> again, Google this uh, information called the um, a WMC guidelines for letter writers, um, but also I have this link onto the PDF that we'll send out. And on this uh, guideline, um, it actually lists uh, various different uh, competencies that 
you as an applicant should have and your letter writer should be able to support. So I think there's like 16 different ones. And it goes through like uh, thinking, critical uh, reasoning, science competencies, pre-professional competencies. And so what I did was as I uh, would write in a brief summary of my interaction with a letter writer, um, I would actually I would then provide them some specific examples that actually correlated with these core competencies. So let's say, for example, I worked uh, research with one professor. Um, I asked them, can you talk a little bit about my critical thinking competency? For example, when we did this project X, Y, and Z, can you talk a little bit about my written communication? Because X, Y, and Z, I had this PowerPoint or uh, article I wrote with you. Or let's say, for example, it's um, a conversation you have uh, with a, a letter writer. Can you have them support your oral communication or your ethical responsibility to others um, because of my work um, that you that we've discussed um, in this, uh, for example. So in a way, um, it may seem this way we're able to have a little bit more control in what kind of information is going to be put in this letter um, because you kind of guide them already to focus on specific qualities or competencies. So if you have a medical school that requires a research letter, you can already know you already know that oh, okay, this mentor is going to focus on these these uh, competencies, and it's going to I'm going to send them that one or X you know X Y and Z. Um, as well, uh, after I, I mentioned about the competencies, I also told my letter writers about a imaginary deadline. Let's say it was by uh, submit by May fifteenth. I told them to do that. Um, and then I told them I would follow up on a separate email on how they should submit, whether it's directly to Interfolio or directly to WMC or the AMCOS system. Um, and then the actual documents I attached were, um, one, it'd be your uh, most updated personal statement. It doesn't have to be perfect, but whatever they is most updated, it allows, gives them something to run off of, um, at least to start. Two, um, transcripts, it could be unofficial, but if you have official, it also works three uh, most updated resume or CV, four is your MCAT score if you have it, five would be this guideline, the WMC guideline for letter writers. Again, it will have instructions that will, um, will help the letter writers um, and also list those competencies in which they can, um, can elaborate on. And then six, any other supporting doc articles whether or documents, whether it's articles you wrote with them or PowerPoints or papers that they created, or any any type of material that can jog their memory of the type of quality of work that you can, that you've done with them, um, give it all to them, um, and then again this will allow them to write the most detailed uh, letter for you and that has substantial evidence for it. And then any um, shares in regards to how we thank our letter writers. Um, I just I think that little cards. Yeah, I think it's going to be dependent. <laughs> most, most uh, especially for um, old many would like a handwritten letter uh, card. I've also given. I would always give a gift of like chocolates or any sort of acceptable thank you gifts as well. Just because again, they spent probably a couple hours of their time to help you. So you know, best we can do is uh, thank them in small ways. And then also keeping them updated if they want to know like your status and how it's going through the medical application process. They actually really enjoy that. So there's that too. Yes. Yeah. When it, also, I wanted to clarify one thing when we were mentioning about what, who can write a letter of recommendation for you. Um, when we're talking about the community college, uh, those will be well and like, it doesn't have to be a professor. But like I mentioned, always make sure with the school that you're applying to what, um, who they want the letters to come from. Uh, they will specifically tell you they want a, two scientific professors or just one and one uh, non-STEM professor. Uh, and then the rest can be either people that you know from community service that you served yes. under with or served with uh, or did a project together. Um, so that's one of the things that I would uh, just wanted to clarify that just please make sure first go check with the schools what type of letters they want. And then based on that, look at the people that you can reach out to. Perfect. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick. We're pretty much on our last slide here and then we'll open it up um, with 
about maybe like 10 minutes. Um, how did you go about drafting a letter of rec if asked by, um, for by one of your writers? So that, so I can talk, I can answer that one. That happened to me, uh, <laughs> my research PI, uh, he literally told me he didn't have time to write this letter, so I should write it for myself. So I was like, nice. Um, so I, I was, I was stuck with the, the confusion. I was like, well, what do I put in the letter? I have no idea. I mean, it was kind of daunting on myself because I think it, I learned, I was scared just to like talk about myself, but I realized that, I, that one of the things that I would, uh, suggest for you all if this happens to you is to just write honestly who you are and the things that you accomplished and also accomplished with the uh, certain individual that asked you to draft that that letter um, one of the things also that I would do to make sure that it doesn't sound like your voice because when you write uh, they can uh, the admissions committees can really uh, see uh, that it was you who wrote the letter because it sounds just like your application and so what I did is I had people that were around me, I had residents that were work I was uh, doing research with that I asked them to review my letter recommendation and that they can edit it and, and see ways that uh, they can change it up so it doesn't sound like me. So you have to go through like a, uh, a few different people around, sorry? Oh, kind of like a filter of people. Yes, thank you, that's the word. The filter to people so that your, your, your voice is lost in the process but the same, concept of you trying to uh, shine yourself is still kept there but from a different perspective from different from someone different uh, voice um, so that's how I did it I went through two people once one person finished reviewing it then I sent it to the other person and they can change it and then I sent it to my my research PI and he even looked through it and changed some things so it was completely uh, from their perspective and not mine but I was able to keep the things that I wanted to shine, that wanted to uh, stand out for me in that letter. But one of the things that you should take in, in consideration is that this is not the time to be like making up things that, oh, he uh, saved the village from a fire or something, I don't know, something extreme. Uh, just be honest to yourself and, 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 and who you really are and to put in that because one of the things that admissions committees have gotten really good at is knowing when someone is lying in their letters of recommendation or their applications because they read these applications they read thousands of applications every year continuously over and over and over again so they've gotten good to the point that they can tell if a student is lying in their application or not so just be honest with yourself uh, through that process if you have to draft a letter um one thing I would like to add, and I just reemphasize, while if you're trying to figure out things that they can write, again, look to that uh, guideline of what letter writers should look at, and then focus on those certain competencies that um, you think that they would be able to best highlight for you, and then just that way you at least have some evidence and some direction in what to write. And oh, and also another thing that I want to input on top of what Andrew said that's really important is that if you don't know how to write a letter and you want to get the best of it, just Google anytime like example or recommendations and you can just base yourself on that. Don't copy word for word, because you know that's plagiarism, but just base yourself on uh, on that uh, concept if you have no idea how to write a letter recommendation, because I had no idea how to write a letter recommendation. So I really looked at different examples and how uh, they went about writing that and yeah, base yourself on that. Awesome. And with that, that was our last slide, but thank you. And best of luck. Um, don't forget to complete the survey to receive that advice sheet that we kept mentioning throughout this entire presentation. Um, like I said, we're going to have like 10 minutes opened up for questions right now if you want. Also, follow L LMSA at, for UC Davis School of Medicine on Instagram. This is their handle. I think that's what it's called, handle. Mm -hmm. Kind of old. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jenny, or should we go back to... Make sure on the chat all the questions were answered. Yeah, that's what I was going to do right now. I'm actually going to open up. Um, and if any of you that have stuck around this long, if you want to either turn on your mic and ask the question or put the you know question in the chat, either way works. We want to hear your beautiful voices. I'm pretty sure you're tired of our voices. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you have a question, Christina? Oh, okay. I'll go ahead and let whoever on the line answer. Ask the question. 
Oh, hey, um, thank you for uh, taking time for the presentation, by the way. I appreciate it. Um, I have a question in regards to committee letters. So I, uh, I, I did a, I did a, I'm not doing a program, a grad school program, and they have a committee letter, but it's a small school. And I'm just a bit concerned because literally there's only one science professor in it. And there's a lot of people that I guess don't know me. I generally don't know how committee letters work in general. I just wanted to know what you guys thought about it. If it's like looked down upon, if I just don't do it. Because I'm a little bit skeptical on doing it or not, because it's a whole entire other process aside from like trying to pick the schools, math school and all that. So I just wanted to know your opinion on it. So I, I do want to say that um, certain schools may only offer committee members, uh, sorry, committee letters. Um, and I know certain programs, they said, if your school offers committee, committee letters, that's the only letters that they accept. So that is going to be program specific. Um, and I think that's something to think about that if your school does offer that, um, it's something worth definitely looking into because sometimes that's all that other programs will accept is only that and not individual letters. Um, but that's not to say that there's other programs that may not. Um, and if you feel like that may not be the strongest uh, letter writers for you, I think always it's always great to have multiple backups um, and really expand out your network to both have a committee letter and also individual professors or letter writers that can focus on uh, aspects of your application you think are most important. And another another thing that I would suggest too is um, if you don't know how about go with it to that school you're applying to, you can always contact the admissions uh, department of the school and just be really straight up with them about the situation that you're going through, uh, and see how uh, if there's something different that you can that can be done. Um, as you know, schools are always moving their their policies and whatnot, whatever it may be for admissions. Uh, not all the time, but sometimes. And so it's, it never hurts to ask, to call and ask about a certain situation. And I'm pretty sure if you're if you're afraid that that's going to affect your 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 application at all. Um, I can tell you that they get thousands of phone calls, so they won't they won't remember who you are because they also they don't know who you are in, in reality. So it's always good to ask. It never it never hurts to ask um, the admissions committee uh, or the department um, how would they go about with the certain letters? Do they accept more of this and that, uh, and so on and so forth? So. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Cece and I had a quick question in regards to how do you weigh how many safe like middle and reach schools you pick and also how many out of state public schools you kind of put into your school list knowing that they don't accept that many out of state, especially in from California. Great question. Um, I think that will mainly rely it will mainly go down to your budget um, and how much you're able to afford. Um, be, just to understand and look at a little perspective, primary applications can range per application eighty to hundred dollars. Secondary is similarly a hundred to one hundred fifty, um, and then um, interviews, etc. Those costs down the line. That's something to consider. But I think also a uh, counter argument would be also. Um, the amount of times you want to apply to medical school, you want to keep it to the minimum. Um, so if you're able to just apply once, make it the best you can and cast a wide net. Um, because one, you don't want to go through the process again. Um, but then two, the, if you do reapply, um, that is going to some, something that you'll have to come up and explain in your application on why you reapply. So if you're able to cast a wide net early on, um, when you know that you're in a location and a position that you think your application is the best it can be, um, I think is is uh, the best idea. In terms of, um, again, the fee assistance program offers 16 and 19 uh, free primary applications is because that's what it's been on the national average is that's how many um, uh, programs people have applied. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to apply to that many. If you feel that you are um, comfortable with less, that's fine. But if you want to go over, um, again, that's something to consider. But probably at a certain level of beyond 
20, 20, 25, 30 programs, it's going to be a lot more difficult because um, it's a lot more work on your end in terms of essay writing um, and then also uh, application submissions. And if you feel like you're going to burn out with that many essays, then it would, turns out to be not as worth it. Manny, do you have something else? No, I just, uh, I completely agree. I think just knowing what your limit is um, and really just keep it to a minimum so that you don't overstress yourself with the different deadlines because all the schools have different deadlines. And once you're in it and, and they get all jumbled up. And so you think one is due this time and you miss it. And uh, that happened to me. I thought a secondary was due a certain time, but it wasn't actually. So I completely missed up that application. So um, just really knowing what your limits are and really, knowing that okay if i'm going to apply out of state am i really going to get in am i really going to stand out on this application if let's say that's that particular school only accepts like 90 percent of in-state uh, so it's just really of you reflecting and seeing um, is this feasible and is possible and is financially uh, possible for me thank you Um, there was a question in the past. Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so Manny, I know that you mentioned you did not qualify for the federal assistance program. Um, yes. For me, I applying to medical school and the financial aspect is a little bit of concern as well. So do you, how did you fund your applications and all of that? So I, I worked, uh, I personally uh, worked and saved some money. Um, I also had to take out, uh, it's a couple, like a one loan uh, for myself so I can apply for that aspect because also I had to pay for the application and also the secondaries and then also travel in the future. Um, I wouldn't say, I, and, I, and I saw that all that, all that money that I got, uh, that loan that I got as an invested in myself uh, for the future. Of course, you're not going to go out and get the biggest loan ever because I mean, that would just add on to the amount of debt you're going to get. But just look at what possible uh, possible what possibilities are out there. If you're working right now, save up some money, make some sacrifices. I had to make some sacrifices uh, with my wife on what on the amount of money that we had to put apart, set apart, so that we can or that well, yeah, we can pay for this application. Um, and also looking at if there's any loan programs. Uh, some uh, banks have loan programs so they can lend you a certain amount of money uh, to use. And so it's also a good thing to look into those. Thank you. No problem. Um, so I'm looking through the chat and there's a couple of questions. Um, one in terms of step scores, I don't believe uh, MSTAR does not show average step scores, um, and I, it's really hard to find. I'm still trying to find the resource in which shows um, average step scores because it's typically on every school's website that they show. Um, did you ever consider any dual programs, uh, MD, PhD, and PH? Um, I personally did consider, but I also decided not to apply because I wanted to um, focus on my medical education and then have as much flexibility as possible in terms of if I wanted to focus on other things, X, Y, and Z or not, because I wasn't 100% sure on what kind of career trajectory, uh, trajectory I wanted to take. Um, so I wanted to have the most flexibility and that was just the main MDP, MND program. Um, Manny, do you have any suggestions, comments on that? Uh, no, I think I agree with what you said. I think it's just looking at what types of things. I, I didn't consider a, a dual program just because, I mean, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> just basically straightforward. Um, but yeah, I could be okay with what Andrew said. Um, one question uh, that I was looking at that I really want to clarify with everybody uh, is talking about the situation with coronavirus and some uh, places shutting down their testing centers and just, just how it's going to affect 
the the school application and all that stuff. Um, so from my from our perspective, uh, UC Davis School of Medicine, what they told us is that they're just basing it off on the situation. Um, there has students that have been reached out, which is recommended that you reach out to admissions of that school and see how your application will be affected due to, uh, due to the closure of the testing sites um, and so on and so forth. So reaching out to the school is one one important thing that they can do. Um, and on and now that the schools have to also adjust to everything that's going on, they're doing everything virtual, so that won't affect like interviews uh, or anything of that. So they don't even have to worry about like interview aspects of it. But that's one critical thing is reach out to the schools, see what they're doing, see how it will affect, give them your personal questions about um, the whole issue with the coronavirus and how it's affected the application process, and they'll guide you the best way possible uh, to this uh, through your application. Um, there's a question from Caroline that was asking about um, where uh, hospital students do the rotations. Um, at, is this important and um, can we look at thing, anything specifically? Is it better to do it at a teaching hospital, et cetera? Um, so I think this is a particular question regarding MD versus DO schools. A lot of DO schools, you have to find your own rotations from what I understand. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits to do rotations at a teaching hospital or facility because the staff members are able are already um, used to teaching you the best, or well, it's not the best, but always keeping that in mind as you're working through your rotation. Um, since we are all first years, we don't necessarily have uh, direct experience in terms of what rotational experience is best or not. Um, so that's the best I can answer for that one. Yeah, the, the, I would say the same. I, I mean, um, I would, uh, one of the things that you can do is, is reach out to those that are third years or talk to the, how I mentioned, talk to the admissions committee and see if they can connect you with someone that is in the rotation years. And you can probably ask them how they like that certain hospital or teaching hospital or that certain school with the rotation. So that's one of the things that you can do if you really want to know that information about the school. Um, there was a question on the types of uh, letter recommendations are and how much weight is given to one or the other. Um, again, that's going to be program specific. Again, uh, on MSAR, it will say what kinds of letters they'll ask for. So if it's a science professor that they ask for, a humanities professor, um, those are the ones that you'll give. And, and unfortunately, we can't say one is weighed heavier, heavier than others because that will be program specific as well. Correct. Um, one thing that Mary had asked is um, that letters of recommendations, if you ask a professor to write one, they refuse because it had to, it has to be confidential. Um, and this is something I do agree that um, it's smart to submit letters that you haven't read um, because it, again, it shows confidentiality. Now that's not to say that you can't submit letters that you've read. Um, so for example, I've had letter writers who um, they wanted me to to read their letters first before submitting it to Interfolio because they want to make sure they reflected me as best as they could. And I, I just, I said, well, that's okay. Like, keep it on the down low because you do sign an agreement that you don't see your letters. Um, but I think that's, I get something that will be personal between you and your letter writer. Um, yeah, Manny, do you have anything to add to that? No, I completely agree. I think it's just, I mean, yeah, I completely agree. I kind of I wouldn't add anything else to that. Let's see. Questions? Now, if they were so, a oh, great question about letters. If they were written a couple of years ago, um, be sure to reach out to them and ask them to update it. If it, updating just means just changing the date, that's fine. Like, if they have other things to add to your letters, that's also great. But we want to make sure when you're submitting your letters to make sure it's within a year is from what I heard was the general recommendation of what is considered up to date letter. Um, so if you do have that on Interfolio, just ask them, shoot a message if they can just at least update it, even if it's just a date, that's something. Let's see. Can you recommend updates? 
um, in terms of if it's worth, if it's preferred from a community college versus a four-year uh, letter recommendation, it will not matter. Um, it's just, again, if they, um, and what, I should say, and what quality of a setting that they've known you in, for example, how long. Um, so I had a letter that was from a community college letter, and um, that was probably one of my strongest ones. But I did go to a four-year, and I just did some classes at uh, community college afterwards just for fun. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, one weighs heavier than the other, just based off of the, the institution that it came from. Um, mainly it's the setting that it was. So if it was a classroom and if it was a professor. And again, a professor, I believe the letters, letter writers have to at least have, um, they can't be graduate students that write your letters. Typically it's, uh, it's someone that is of faculty um, level. Um, and TAs, that's another question is um, if TAs write the letter recs, it's, I, I think it's definitely not recommended if you have a TA, what's probably more ideal is to get it from the professor. Um, but again, it'll be on the type of setting, like can you have them co-sign, for example, have the TA co-sign with the professor on this letter, so at least you have a backing that it was from the faculty instructor that wrote your letter. Are there any other questions that you guys see? Not that uh, I noticed. I started, yeah, I started picking out and responding. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Um, oh, oh, I have, they came out a question um, by Arnold. Um, wondering would it be a good deadline for ourselves to try to have everything together to submit, which is a really good question. Um, I think the earliest the possible is best just because how we said uh, how a lot of uh, schools are enrolling admissions. So um, they start filling in their spots so that they can get accepted. And so the earliest you can is best. If for some reason you cannot get it um, the day that it opens or a weekend, uh, try, you can take your time, but I would highly recommend to submit all your applications by end of July, early August. Um, that'd be the, the, the latest you should uh, uh, submit them so that you have that the ability, the capacity, the possibility of then reading your application and um, extending in a, a secondary or interview. That's a great. Um, this actually sparks something that's important is ideal of the verification process. So when you submit your primary application, your application takes some time to get verified to show that your grades, your transcripts are all correct. Um, your MCAT is correct, you are who you are, your social, or whatever information you submit, um, they verify it all. And so that takes some time before it actually gets sent to your, your schools um, themselves. So in June, when primary applications open, if you submit it in the first week, verification takes about a week. And then it stalls and waits and um, being wait to be sent until July 1st, in which it'll be sent to all the schools that you wanted to submit for primaries. If you submit your initial primary application in July or August, even September, it may take up to four weeks, up to six or eight weeks. And so during that time, it's just sitting there waiting to get verified, still hasn't been sent to in your schools, and then um, you're just waiting a waiting game. So the idea is, again, as Manny said, submit as soon as possible. And at this point that you submit your primaries, you don't, you don't need to have your letter of recommendations. Also, you don't need to have all your list of schools you want to apply for ready. What you can do is if you know there's one school that you really want to apply to and, you and your whole application is ready, primary application in terms of personal statement, final draft, um, and then transcripts and grades, make sure you're, you also, by the way, in May time, request your transcripts because um, and to be sent to WMC. Um, because that can take up to uh, two weeks to submit. And you can access your WMC uh, application as soon as, I believe, early May, mid-May, in which you can get your ID ready and then get your uh, the transcripts from your schools, all the schools, community colleges, universities that you've been to, even if it's taken one class from there, you have to have it submitted uh, and sent directly to WMC. Um, Oh my gosh, where are we going with that? So then um, when you choose your, when you submit your primary, 
you can just you can select one and then while it's getting verified you can add on extra schools and then that just gets sent um, later uh, or actually be sent together at July 1st if you do it in early June um, if it's already been verified and later once you submit and add a school to that list it'll automatically send your application to that school as well um, one, I just want to answer the question here. It said even high school transcripts. No, uh, when you go to the application for medical school, they will only look uh, from your college and on. Uh, and that's a good thing to bring up is uh, maybe you had an activity, maybe you want to add something that you did during high school that was very really critical to you, then you may add it, but just when you write that activity, whatever you did, add how it impacted you as a person later on in your future to become a physician. Don't just add it just because it looks nice because they will only look at stuff from college and on. Um, if it's classes though, if you say, for example, it took community college classes or AP classes in high school, um, you do have to submit those. Um, so yes. There, yes. So that will be, um, there'll be a section on how to submit that under your transcript. Uh, as you input in all the grades and times, that just means that you'll have to be able, you'll have to submit as well, um, transcript times. Sorry. Let's see. Uh, the turnaround for screening schools um, is not almost immediately around July 1st. Uh, some schools vary just because of the load of people that they get. So that's another thing to take in consideration is, um, you can't really know how many people will apply to this school, but you can take a wild guess. So that also takes into effect how long that process will take in the schools uh, that you're applying to. Also on MSAR, it'll, there's a section that says if they do screen primary applications or no. So if they say no, that means if you submitted your primary in early June, every school that you put on your list, when they receive it July 1st, you'll get an automatic secondary within that day, probably within minutes after it gets sent. Uh, sometimes it takes a couple days. And so this is something to plug in is the importance of secondary and pre-writing your uh, essays. Pr prompts, secondary prompts can be found online. Um, you can look at various, like actually student doctor networks, they do have um, a resource of previous year's prompts. Um, but what you can do is look at those prompts from previous years, start fleshing it out, and then when secondaries roll around, you can do second edits and then submit as soon as possible. I, I know we were talking about secondaries, but I just wanted to, I just want to say this right now. Don't, don't write a, sec, a new secondary for each school that you are going to apply to because that will be a lot of writing. Um, and I personally didn't like that. So just write a main one because a lot of the things that schools ask for will be kind of similar in a sense. Mm -hmm. So just make see how you can um, tailor that secondary and pick pick from different places. Yeah, correct. Um, so that you can be able to apply it for that one. I know we didn't talk about we were talking about the recommendations and picking schools, but just just an FYI when you're doing your secondaries, don't go out and write thousands of secondaries because that's going to be a lot of time wasted. And Concerning uh, committee letters, um, if you did a program, yeah, you can look at uh, MSAR. It tells you uh, what letters that they want, individual letters or committee letters. And also you can just uh, call the admissions department of the school that you want to apply to. Um, that way they can tell you more straightforward the, the stuff that they require from you concerning letters of recommendation. And what are the other questions you might have uh, for them? All right, everybody, I wanted to interrupt really quick here. I am aware that it, we're uh, past the time here and oh, yeah. whoever is still on the line, you're still welcome to join us and speakers, Andrew, Manny, and Jenny. Uh, it's up to you guys how long you would like to stay on and answer these questions. So I just wanted to put that out there and just remember this will be recorded. So feel free to email me after you get the post survey. You can find my email in the Eventbrite link. I believe it's at the bottom there. So just shoot me an email and I can forward you the YouTube link once this video has been posted. Um, I'm free to answer. I'm here as long as it's needed to answer as many questions. So um, that's all yeah. I'm going to say. I can I can stay until like eight thirty ish. So okay. I'm so good. 
<laughs> um, by the way, I saw Jackie's question. Yeah, we have one more question. Um, and by the way, I saw your comment earlier, Jackie. Way all they're from Virginia. <laughs> um, yeah. So, in terms of uh, what you should focus on your experiences, again, focus on experiences that are most meaningful to you, and things that can demonstrate your passion of what kind of position you want to be. And if these experiences were in college, talk about them. If these experiences were in your postdoc, talk about them. Um, you don't necessarily have to weigh recent experiences more than others. If they were, again, impactful and meaningful to you, that's what you should write about. Yeah. Another thing that I would add on to that is don't try to, if, if you have an activity, a, a extracurricular activity or something that you have that you really don't feel the strongest with, but you just want to include it because it, it tailors to the school, um, I would uh, advise not to do that uh, most precisely just because you want to write about something that you are passionate about that you can really describe in a sense that it shows that you really enjoyed and that you really uh, benefited but also provided benefit for others in that uh, activity that you did and so uh, like like Andrew said it doesn't matter uh, when it was but just that it was meaningful that it had a great impact on you and you had a great impact on your community uh, that will make the biggest difference in the extra activities. Um, I do want to shout out to Nicole Martinez, who did post medschoolhq.net. That's actually one of the resources I also would refer to a lot. Um, and these, there's some links that post on the PDF that will be sent out later um, that is directed towards medical school, medical school hq.net. Um, also, two other blogs that are in the San Diego area that were super, super helpful was um, Savvy uh, SavvyPremed.com or Passport Admissions, and then the um, Shemison Consulting, and these links will be, uh, I can post them in the chat, but they were really helpful in terms of uh, finding really important information, not only about application process, but interviewing, how to write certain letters, post-interview, pre-interview. <coughs> And I want to kind of add to Jackie's question really quick. Um, overall, because like I was in that same position in which like I had like a fair amount of things from like undergrad, like in my master's and working. Um, overall, though, like when you have written your like overall personal statement, you should note what your theme is of your application overall. And that theme is usually going to be ultimately answering like why you want to go to medical school um so any of those activities that you feel resonate really really high with that overall theme is worth putting in that application so there's that too um and then i think there's a one more question oh do we do we automatically get the pdf or do we have to request it um you guys are going to do the survey i think they're going to send you a link at the end and once you complete the survey they'll go ahead and send that pdf to your email yeah um, and also i just want to clarify on that on that pdf that you'll get you'll get my uh my and andrew's information uh both email and cell phone i think right so um i add mine in two oh quick. yeah cool so I, I, I speak for myself and I think I kind of the same for him, like Andrew mentioned, uh, you can contact us at any time um, and we can answer your questions. If it's not about letters of recommendation or uh, other things, you can, you know, contact us about anything. If you're feeling stressed, if you just want to talk about, talk to someone about this, the, the situation, uh, you have a joke, uh, I'm always open for jokes. I mean, you know, it's always fun to laugh, but you know, but honestly, seriously, you can, you can contact us all the time. And we're, we're more than happy to help you with anything that you have uh, going on. So, how old are all of us? So I'm 28. I'm turning 30 this July. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Ooh, we I mean, gotta have fun. <laughs> and I'm uh, 25. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, you didn't know that. Oh, Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> So as you see, there it's very possible to get into medical school later um, for those that are not traditional. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have. A, there's a there's a there's a student there's a classmate of mine who she is 35 right now in her class, and another one that's 42. So 
You can always go to medical school no matter where you, what, what age you are. Yeah, G apply to medical school when you feel you're ready because medical school is always going to be there. Yes. It's only when you feel like you're ready. And I think yes. this is advice I want to give for everyone as well. As you're assessing and applying for medical school, don't feel rushed to apply. If you feel like you're not putting yourself on the best foot forward and you don't feel like your application is, is best representing you as you are now, take a moment to really consider if postponing a year to work on that part of the application and make sure that it fully does reflect you to the best of your capabilities um, would benefit you in terms of the kind of programs that you'll um, get accepted to, but also in terms of um, setting yourself up the best uh, you are. So um, this is just, again, I know that for everyone have their certain uh, timelines, um, but don't feel afraid to postpone a year if it's necessary to make sure you are fully ready and um, making sure that this is presenting yourself the best possible. What I, what I would add on to that, uh, that I completely agree with this, is don't run faster than you have strength. Um, the, this is, like I mentioned, it's a long, long journey. And a lot of people rush in, in it too fast, thinking that they have to finish in a certain amount of time, and they burn out easily because their strength wasn't able to push them forward to, to get to where they wanted to get. So um, it's okay to take years off. It's okay to do other things, to explore, to to really um, learn more about yourself and do those things. Um, but also keep the goal in mind. I mean, don't delay it many years down the line, but just how Andrew said is make sure that you're ready for that uh, if, a change of event in your life because it's a, it's a big change. Your life changes completely, I can tell you that. For better and at times for a little worse because you're going to be stressed out. Not to scare anybody away, but that's the, you know medical school is kind of that way too. But um, it's 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 good not to run faster than you have strength. I can tell you that as you go through those application process. Okay. Let's see. Are there any last questions that we can answer for the remaining thirty plus? Um, may may I ask another question? Absolutely, sure. sure. Um, so I um, Andrew mentioned uh, when asking for a letter, almost like coaching your letter writer as to how to um, showing them where you want them to go in a way. And so I am a non-traditional applicant that has worked in um, tech for the last three years, and so I, I'm trying or I'm asking a few of my writers to be some of the my managers or people that I've worked with. However, I worry that they're going to be too technical and not necessarily um, kind of encompass what a medical school letter of recommendation would be. It would be more like a PhD letter of recommendation. And so I was wondering if you could provide some insight as to how to coach maybe someone a lot more senior into how to write what you want them to write for you. What's great about that necessarily in terms of M PhD versus MD letters is that letters regardless will be applicable for either or, um, especially if you focus mainly on the core competencies that are on that guideline. Um, it's very generalized as in it can be applied for either type of letter. Um, in terms of coaching these individuals, because um, most likely letter writers are should at least understand that it's not they're going to be talking to maybe non-professionals um, that they sh should be able to translate their letter accordingly um, so i think what we can as a suggestion what i would do in your situation would just to remind them um, actually i would actually play on that strength if they are a senior um, and very technical field have them focus on on those competencies that are focused on certain technicalities like science competencies or um, um, your critical thinking, et cetera. Um, because if they are able to talk critically and maybe even technically about that situation, that just shows that that's much more of a strength that you have uh, to represent that. Um, so I think adapting 
their strengths to the competencies and goals will actually make it much more of you can be able to align that rather than have them focus on other competencies that may be too technical for example interpersonal skills etc if that mm-hmm. your focus is more science-based if, if, yeah, and what, one thing that I can add to is if that happened to me. I had a, 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 I asked one of my letter writers didn't have the experience of writing letters for medical school. And so what I did was just, I included everything that, that Andrew uh, stated before. And then at the end, I was just like, oh, just in case you, uh, you mentioned that you hadn't written a letter, uh, here are some examples that I pulled up from the internet. Uh, just make sure that they're good ones. Make sure that they like show what they're saying because there's a lot of examples out there that you can find. And just say like, no, this is kind of the example that um, that I found that you can look at and see what you like and what you can change in your application. So that um, if for some reason uh, the technicality is there, um, they can also, uh, if you yourself want to modify it to a different aspect, you can do it uh, to sending that example that, that you can find. Great advice. Thank you. That was perfect. No problem. All right. Any questions? Anyone well, have I a good? Saw that tomorrow the survey should be sent out, so expect it somewhat tomorrow, um, and then that's. As soon as you complete it, that's when you guys will get back to the app. But other than that, it was really great. Thank you again to Andrew and to Manny for helping me. Of course. <laughs> awesome. And uh, all all three of our contact information will be on that PDF. So with any other um, thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, obviously jokes for Manny. I like yeah. Jokes. I like uh, this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you'll have our contact information. Yeah, you, and best best of luck. Let best of luck to all of you guys, uh, everyone. Um, y'all, you're all gonna kill it. You're gonna do great. And like I mentioned, enjoy the process. Enjoy every moment of it because if we don't enjoy it, then everything life is just dull. So uh, hey, this is this is a marathon, not a sprint. So enjoy, <laughs> it's definitely a marathon. En- enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey, not the destination. So I totally agree with that. Thank you all for taking this time out of your night um, from across the nation. So we hope that this information has been helpful. And again, if you have any other questions for us, just feel free to text me or send us an email and we'll be happy to answer. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be here to help. Have a good night, everybody. Stay safe out there. All right, yes. thank you, everybody. Have a good night.